Hello and welcome. I'm Lisa Louise Cook. And you know what I've been thinking a lot about lately? I've been thinking about joining the Daughters of the American Revolution. It's called the DAR. And one of the reasons is because years ago, as I was doing my genealogy research, I discovered I do have a Revolutionary War soldier ancestor, a direct ancestor. Um, But over the years, the big question has been, how do you apply to the DAR? What's the process? And I got the sense uh, early on that it was kind of a a more complicated uh, process. But lately I've been hearing uh, there might be an easier way to do this. So I've been kind of wondering about that. And if you've been wondering about what it would take to join the DAR, what the DAR is all about, we're going to have some fun figuring this out together today in this video. You know, recently I was uh, the keynote speaker at the South Carolina Genealogical Society Conference, and I ran into Barbara Jurs. And um, in fact, I ran into her many years ago in Atlanta, very early on in my career, and she was very, very encouraging. But this time around, when I saw her, she was encouraging me about joining the DAR. And the fact that there's so much information available on so many of these Revolutionary War soldiers that it's not that hard necessarily to connect up to other people's uh, work that they've done. So with that encouragement and her offer to help me in this process, I've invited her to the show today to help us all. Welcome to the show, Barbara. Well, thank you, Lisa. I am just so excited to be here because DAR is a passion of mine and I have been a fan of yours since the very first time that I saw you speak um, in Atlanta about um, the internet genealogy. And then it was so much fun this summer uh, to be presenters. And um, my position now in South Carolina with the South Carolina DAR is the um, chair of the State Lineage Research Committee. So I have the opportunity of working with daughters all over South Carolina Uh, to work towards applications and what we call supplemental applications. Uh, Prior, and I still am a a registrar of our chapter. My chapter is the Battle of Cowpens chapter. And uh, so I have the pleasure of helping many ladies uh, discover their lineage, prove their lineage, and be accepted into the DAR. And... um, as we were talking a little bit, uh, you were mentioning about the Daughters of the American Revolution, and so many people have the misconception that it is just a lineage society. But DAR was founded in 1890, actually October 11th coming up, and it is a service organization. So many people do not know that it is a service organization. Uh, Some of the things that we really emphasize are historic preservation, education, patriotism, but uh, some of the other things, we foster good citizenship and we honor our ancestors. We are devoted to educating youth, preserving our past. We promote genealogy, American history, and all kinds of service projects. Anything that you have an interest in, you can find a chapter to either use your talents and gifts to help the chapter and the state and the nation. Uh, We log in our service hours all all over the nation in different chapters. So it is a very vibrant and very exciting type of um, organization to be a part of. Um, You're so lucky because you live in the state of Texas and our brand new president general is from Texas. So our president general is like the CEO of the whole organization. And she just began her administration in um, late late June, early July. And um, there are many, many fabulous uh, chapters in Texas. Texas is very, very uh, much a state that supports the Daughters of the American Revolution. So you are very lucky. Many chapters to choose from if you are able to um, get your lineage proven. I'm happy to hear it. Okay, so let's start at the beginning because there'll be many people uh, watching who are in the same boat that I'm in, knowing that they're pretty sure they have a Revolutionary War ancestor. They think they know how they connect to that person. Give us kind of the high level overview of what 
are the steps of the process? And then we can kind of get a little more into going through those steps with uh, my situation. Well, Lisa, there are many ways to start the process. DAR recommends that you start with what you know, which is, as you know, in genealogy, that's what many um, individuals are told to do. And so you start with um, uh, making your pedigree chart or, or writing down as much as you know about your family and begin finding documents. I work with each um, individual a little bit differently, so sort of in a multifaceted way. If the individual knows she has a DAR relative, that really is a good way to start. Uh, so if you have a mother, a grandmother, an aunt, a great grandmother, and you know that name, um, that is very helpful because she will have a verified application that will provide you a lineage that has been verified by DAR. Um, it's very helpful to, if you're in an area, um, approach a chapter, or you can go on the DAR website and express your interest and the state or a national someone will get in touch with you to uh, tell you what chapters are in the area and help you start that process and go visit them. Each chapter has a registrar. Some chapters have lineage research committee chairs, and the registrar will meet, meet you and you take your information uh, to her and can help you determine which line, um, whether you have a verified patriot. Now there is some work you can do at home because you can go on to the DAR website. You see on that uh, page it says what we do. So a non-member can look all over this website and learn in more detail the things that I was trying to um, tell you about what the society does. But at the top you'll see join, GRS, give, members, genealogy, blog, and shop. And the join button will take you directly to the area that I was mentioning that can help you um, fill out an interest survey or get, get you in touch if you don't know someone in your area. And then the section that says genealogy, if, if you click on that, the genealogy tells you all kinds of things as to how, where you can begin. Like it says, start with what you know and speaking to your relatives and um, begin collecting documents. Uh, but there are some databases which we can't show online, but the ancestor search, the membership search and the descendants database all have information of all verified applications that go back to the very beginning. So in your case, you had told me you had an ancestor and I, that was the first thing that I did before I even looked at your pedigree um, to see if he's in the system to make sure there were not any red notes, meaning that there were problems that have been discovered since a person went in like service or maybe an error in lineage. And um, then I can go and look to see how many applications there are. When was the last one uh, that, that got verified? And you can do a lot of that on your own. When you have identified a chapter that you're very interested in, the registrar has the ability to go a little bit further and to see what we call images to utilize in the process of helping the applicant. But there's a lot you can do on your own. Let's just say, for example, that you did not know who your patriot was. You could use the descendants database if you had your pedigree chart and you could plug in the names of all of your descendants. And this a lot of people don't use this base, but it's wonderful for genealogists anywhere because you can find lineages. So you've put your chart up there, and I actually did this in preparation to see where would be the uh, an applicant in your line. I was hoping that maybe I'd find a great right. grandparent or you know someone much closer. We all hope that as registrars, <laughs> but um, I was able to identify two children of your patriot, who is, we were talking about whether you pronounce it Yehu or Jehu, um, and there were uh, some children that were identified, not 
uh, and one of yours um, is a verified, the son Henry. Um, and so um, you can go in, as I said, into that descendants database and put all the different descendants names in, the basic name and maybe a state if you know where, where he was born, and pull up different suggestions. And that helps, especially if you don't know if you have an ancestor, but if you have an ancestor like you did, then I sort of start at the top because at, at the time we started talking, I did not know your full pedigree. The other way is like the DAR mm -hmm. suggested is that if you know your pedigree, you would go um, work your way up. If you have a DAR member, um, you can put the member number in, like say your aunt or your grandmother or a great aunt, if she will share the DAR member. Now, uh, people who are not, do not have the higher levels, if you're you know, just the general public, you will not be given any names of anyone that is living because DAR is very, very protective about identity. Well, that's terrific. So it was an advantage then to have my pedigree chart. If somebody's watching and, and they haven't gone that far back, then really it's starting with the genealogical research, uh, citing your sources. We're going to need those sources, it sounds like, to make the proof along the way of the connections. Uh, and there's the website. Uh, Barbara, when we were talking about the search um, links that we showed there, do we need to have an account uh, is there any kind of restriction or can just the general public go in and start searching? The general public can search, um, absolutely. You can get lots of great hints. You can, you can put in ancestors' names to find out if they are an, a verified patriot. You can use the descendants and um, see if any of the descendants are in lineages. You can use the membership to see if you've find that there is like, like your, if you have an aunt that is a member, it will put that in and find out whether there is a verified, you know, lineage, hopefully, you know, it, it is, and doesn't have some things that come about because as more and more applications are done and more and more research is done, sometimes those early, early app applications that were not done with the sources that we utilize now with the genealogical proof standards, they were many times, um, uh, hearsay or uh, letters or um, books and um, DAR has uh, and rightly so um, been putting a lot of emphasis on the proof because it is proof of bloodline biological the biological line um, and I also forgot to say too that uh, they have they have a wonderful section that's um, for Bibles uh, Bible records. Now you can get some hints as a non-member, uh, but again, when you work with the registrar, the registrar can actually help you with your research to identify whether there's a Bible with your actual family, because DAR has been collecting Bible records and still is collecting Bible records, transcribing them. It's a fabulous project. We also have what is called the GRC, and that has many, 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 many books and uh, DAR daughters have been uh, transcribing, going to graveyards, going to repositories uh, for many years and transcribing and making books that can be utilized either for hints or in some cases when it's an actual transcription is accepted for part of the lineage proof. The library link to the DAR is incredible. And then there's a Patriots Index also so you can go to the Patriots Index and find out about all kinds of Patriots. The DAR has an incredible, incredible amount of genealogical uh, information that even a non-DAR member can utilize. I know many of the Sons of the American Revolution applicants because uh, the SAR usually accepts a DAR application, not vice versa. Um, and they will often go on the public site to see if there are lineages to help with the individual in their SAR application and also other societies too. So as you were looking at my pedigree chart and you were looking people up in the system, um, we know that Jehu served in the Revolutionary War. 
does the system, when we go and search, does that tell us that I indeed have somebody at some point who was a member? Did you find other members or did you, there must have been somebody, I guess, who tied into that same ancestor. But how do I know when I look at it, what work I might need to do to make sure that I can prove that I connect to that? That's a good question, Lisa. Um, well, yes, I did look up Jehu Burkhart. There are 37 DAR members who have joined under him. The most recent was probably okay. about three years ago. I can't give you the specifics on that. And that particular person went in on a different sibling than yours. Um, and uh, your the son is Henry. And it's also, that's another really good point. When you're looking for your patriot, if you do know a patriot, knowing who the child is, whether it's male or female, is extremely important because that helps when you pull up on the database. It helps you figure out which applications will go under that particular child. As doing genealogy, you always have to remember that sometimes you've got to go out into the sibling lines. Now, you were lucky and the Henry was proven, but let's just say that there was another sibling of Henry that you descended from and he had not been a proven line. You would want to find out what documentation the, the descendant, the DAR member, submit for that sibling. Maybe there's a Bible record that lists all of the children. And that's where when you really begin the process seriously with a chapter and with a registrar or a lineage research chair, well, the, the registrars are actually able to go in and look at the um, documents that many of the documents that were submitted to help you in your genealogical proofs. Now, you ask about the genealogical uh, proofs for DAR. Oh gosh, I calculated it at one time, but at, at, an, at eight generations, the number of tiny data entries that we make from the name of the person, which sometimes has a first name, a middle name, and a last name, the date of birth, which has a day, a month, and a year, and then the location of uh, the place, which can have a town, a county, and a state. If you look at each generation and see the number of tiny data entry that you, you need, and then multiply that by eight, you come up with anywhere from over 300 to 400 tiny facts. So as you, as you collect your documents, you always have to be thinking about these things. You need to be able to prove a date of birth and a place of birth and a date of death and a place of death, and that varies according to the generation. So in generations one, two, and three, DAR expects completeness. And so you would need to, for example, for you, you would have to provide a complete amount of information for your birth. And it used to be a requirement that if you were married, you had to provide your spouses, that's now optional. Um, if you have children or nieces and nephews, um, you may want to go ahead and do that or anticipate grandchildren because it makes it a whole lot easier. As you know, sometimes getting vital records is tough. And if you go ahead and do that and have it in the system, then it gets verified. Now, once you hit the fourth generation, the fourth generation is a, is a tricky generation in the sense that DAR says that beginning with the fourth, you only have to provide a minimal amount of information, and that is either a place of birth and date or a place of death and the date of death, one or the other, not half of each. However, many of us have ancestors now where the fourth generation is in a time when vital records are available. And so DAR expects that if the vital records are available, you should try your hardest to get those. So, uh, and, and registrars advised me and my mentor registrar, who'd been a registrar for 33 years, um, who's, who I, I took her place, she always taught me, as well as many other registrars, 
Treat the fourth generation like the third. In other words, try to go past the minimum and try to get your death certificates and your birth certificates. The marriage certificates, I really uh, encourage because once you get back, it proves the name changes. And it is the easiest way to either get a marriage record, and there is a difference between a marriage record and a marriage certificate, um, try to get that because that's the easiest way to prove a name change. Um, and so then you follow that rule from the fourth generation, treat it like the third, that's just good advice. Then the fifth, all the way up to the Patriot, follow that same procedure. When you get to the Patriot, there are a lot of little caveats to it because the Patriot has a set of data that is required. And if it's already verified, you don't have to redo it. The spouse has another and the registrar has a guidelines book and she can tell you specifically what your scenario is because she can go in and look to see how many pieces of data are missing. Um, but basically, the, the patriot needs a date of death and a place of death and a birth. But the wife, it can vary depending upon whether she... Are we going to be um, submitting this information on a printed form? Are we providing the information to the registrar and they are entering it? Or are we entering directly into a website form? And what method are we going to be delivering all this in our final application? Well, good questions. Um, DAR has uh, paper forms that are still being utilized, and we now have gone to electronic version. Um, and the electronic works really, really wonderfully um, if the member is able to contribute electronically and work with um, the registrar who also has been trained to do that. Some people really, really like that. You just have it's a it's a teamwork approach, and it can be done you know long distance. Some prefer to still do the paper. The normal process, and I can use yours as an example, if you, if you had approached me and said, hey, I'm interested in joining the Battle of Cowpens chapter in South Carolina, I'm moving there. Um, I would download your Patriot and I would take the most recent application and in your case, it was about three years ago. And I would download it and do what we call build an app so that I would, there would be an application populated um, automatically with your ancestor. And I would take out all of the generations that have nothing to do with you. And then that's when I would look to see, oh, did Lisa have a great grandmother who was in DAR? And if you had, then I would go to that application and download it and merge it or cut a copy and paste it in. Um, and that's where uh, each chapter is a little bit different depending upon how large they are, how trained their genealogists are. Some chapters have big teams where um, the registrar can download that application, send it with the permission of the applicant and have people work with that individual and help them build it. Others. Uh, like in, in my case, um, so many of the ladies uh, need a lot of help with the lineage research and I'm training people in my chapter. Uh, I can send uh, your downloaded one to a trusted um, DAR member and say, Lisa, can, I would like you to be working with this particular person. She can send it to you electronically and let you fill it in as to the best of your ability with the documents that you have. The electronic version is totally different. It has a totally different set of um, uh, process, and that's where you do it in a chapter where that is being practiced. It sounds like it's a teamwork approach, as you said, with a local chapter. So how does a, a new applicant decide which chapter to join? Do they each have their own website, or do we do that through the main website? That's a great question, too. Um, We've had several Texans move to South Carolina and um, 
They found out about the chapters in my region by going to the DAR national website and, and filling out the electronic um, information. And it gets filtered back to our South Carolina membership chair or maybe uh, directly to a, a, a district director or maybe to several chapters of the regions, which are the names for our presidents or the registrars. In your particular case, and I did a little bit of research to find out what chapters are in the area where you live, and um, I can share that information uh, with you. And then you can contact each of those chapters from the website. I just put in a search, Texas DAR chapters, and there is a long list of chapters all over the state, and many of them have fabulous websites. And it tells all about um, their chapter, what their projects are, and sometimes they have um, Facebook pages, uh, sometimes they have um, listings of the different awards they've won or the different projects that they are involved in. And then I encourage most chapters now love to have guests. And once you make that contact with either the regent, which is like I said, the president, or a registrar, or a membership chair, if the, if the chapter has a membership chair, uh, they will invite you to a meeting. And I encourage you to go to a meeting. Some other things that, that may help is if you're a, uh, still in the working career, you might wanna find a chapter that meets on the weekends or in the evenings. But if that doesn't matter, it may be that choosing a day of the week is more important because you might have other obligations, say on Mondays and Tuesdays, you can't go to. There are all kinds of ways to start the investigation. And because you have communicated to me that you didn't already have some chapters in mind, I think uh, going to the DAR website and um, looking and reading all about DAR and then Googling Texas chapters and choosing your area of where you live and what would be the closest uh, to you and um, contacting them because there's usually on their website, if you're interested, then they give um, information about them. If you are joining during this time, you are going to be joining during a very exciting time. Most chapters and the national are gearing up for the 250th anniversary of the revolution. So many chapters are doing all kinds of things to get ready for that. Well, I'd love to just wrap up and have you share. I'd, I'd love to know what has been uh, involved in the DAR meant for you. What do you like most about it? Oh my gosh, Lisa. Um, well, I was lucky that I was in the children of the American Revolution from about, gosh, I guess about age 11 or 12 until going off to um, college. My grandmother had been in the DAR. She, I did not know it was her dream for me to be in both organizations, the children of the American Revolution and the DAR. She died when I was a young, young child. But she instilled in me, as did all of my grandparents, a love for genealogy and, and patriotism and um, history. And as careers come and families and so forth, there was no one that told me to join right after CAR, to go right into, into DAR. I wish I had known that, but that's okay. Uh, I had the opportunity to, um, to, be, to go and visit a chapter and join and it has been one of the most rewarding experiences. I just love the idea of learning about our constitution, learning about the history of the nation, but also the history of the region where I live. Uh, I am native South Carolinian, although I've lived in other Southeastern states um, and my ancestry are all Northern. And I learned so much about how the backwoodsmen and the militia uh, in the upstate of South Carolina was so involved in Cowpen, the Battle of Cowpens and Kings Mountain. Uh, having grown up in historic Camden, South Carolina, where the Battle of Camden was, I was very aware of that. Um, I also love the projects that many of the chapters do. We support veterans. We support patriotism. We support education. We give scholarships. We do all kinds of things for um, schools. Um, 
it's just unbelievable the amount of service that we can do. And so I love that aspect of what we as women are doing for our nation. Um, I could just talk on and on and on. I love the camaraderie of um, other women who um, enjoy learning. And so many of the chapters have incredible programs that can touch on all topics. And I know that my education has just grown so much. And then, of course, loving genealogy as I do, um, working on applications and memorializing these ancestors and honoring the ladies that join and, and telling them the stories that I discovered that they may not have known. They just might have known. I know I had a Revolutionary War ancestor, but in the process, you're starting from the time you are born and having to research or look at all of the generations and you learn things about your family or and learn things about the family that you are helping the applicant with that they don't know and they learn so much heritage. I could just go on and on. You can tell I'm so excited about it. I think all the lineage societies have this, this enthusiasm and excitement also. Well, I appreciate you sharing your enthusiasm and excitement with all of us. I'm excited to explore it further and do my homework, make some of those final connections, and also get a chance. Like, I, I'm going to take you up on the idea of I'd like to go visit a couple of local chapters and, and see where I'd like to, to get involved. Uh, there's nothing better than learning more about family history, our country, how we were fortunate enough to be in this wonderful, wonderful country and uh, here today and helping to share that. I have a new grandbaby on the way, so there's there's just lots of generations to come. Um, when I was doing yours, and I told you about this through an email, I got so excited because not your direct line, but the sibling ended up settling in a county where I have property and I was looking at documents and seeing names of clerks and seeing rivers and talking about the deeds and how they got there. And um, I was like, oh my gosh, this is just so wonderful. I wish you could see pictures of where part of her family went to. But even before that, um, the North Carolina connection and the Yadkin River Valley is mm -hmm. just such a beautiful area. And I was like, oh, I wish I could show Lisa where part of her family came. Well, of course, part, <laughs> the sibling that ended up in Ash County came from parents that, that would have gone into that Yadkin Valley. But that's part of the thing of being able to share with someone that lives far away from their ancestral area and tell them how if you've had personal experience with it. Yeah. And it's amazing how many connections we all have. I'm sure that happens a lot as you visit with different people as, that are part of the DR. And certainly we, we find that in our genealogy serendipity of people we sit next to at the ar archives of the libraries. It's amazing. Uh, wonderful to talk with you. I'm going to check back in with you after I do more homework. And um, Barbara, thank you so much for helping all of us learn more about the DAR and get involved. Appreciate it. Well, it has been an honor, Lisa, to talk with you and to share your excitement and also an honor to represent South Carolina DAR and the National DAR and my chapter. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm.